All right, good morning. Welcome in, welcome in. We still got folks coming in, but we are glad you are here and we are ready to worship with you today. All right, welcome to Rutledge Falls Baptist Church. If you're a guest with us this morning, we are glad you are here. We'd love for you to fill out one of those cards uh, that says connect on it in the pew in front of you and drop that in the offering plate a little bit later in our service. We don't want to bug you, but we would just love to say thank you for being here, okay? Uh, we've got several things going on in the next few weeks, and so hopefully you got a bulletin and you can be aware of what is happening. Uh, if not, grab one on your way out so that you uh, can know where you can plug in and be a part of what the Lord is doing here at the falls, okay? Okay. Uh, our Annie Armstrong Easter offering, easy for me to say, we're collecting that. We'll have another little short video a little bit later in service on that, but that goes directly to North American missions, okay? Church planters and missionaries across North America, um, the United States and Canada. So we want you to be a part of that. We have a church goal of $3,000, and uh, we are shy on that right now, so we need to pick up uh, the steam, and we'll continue to push towards that, okay? Senior Adult Ministry, remember they are leaving today, right after church. The reservation is at 115, so they'll meet in the foyer right after service today, okay? Um, and then leave from there. Uh, our California mission trip to support Echo Church in Anaheim, the dates there are July 11th through the 16th. Approximate cost is about $800. Can't give you a for certain number because flights fluctuate, um, but if you can, we need a commitment by next Sunday, okay? If you have questions, uh, come see me. I'd be happy to answer those, um, and uh, we want to get flights secured as quickly as possible so that we can get everyone on the same flight, um, and um, sometimes as you get closer, they get more expensive. So, a, we want everybody on the same flight, and we want to get them for the best price as possible. So if you can let me know by next Sunday, that would be fantastic. I already had a couple people let me know today. All right, Good Friday service. I know that's Coffee County spring break, and uh, so if you're out of town, we understand, but we hope you'll be here on March 29th, 6 p.m., and we'll focus on uh, the crucifixion of our Savior. And then Easter on Sunday, March 31st, our regular schedule, 9 a.m. Sunday school, 10 a.m. worship service. Uh, there will be no evening service, and we will all be together. No nursery, and that's okay. Love the sound of children. It's not a bother at all. Duck River Women's Night of Worship, Saturday, April 13th at Estill Springs First Baptist Church. Okay, If you want to be a part of that, there's some flyers around and the uh, email address to RSVP is on there as well. And then Women of Joy, if you've not paid for your ticket, please see Miss Joyce Young this morning. Okay, And then are there, are there some available if folks want to go? There are a few extra available if you uh, did not commit and want to go. And that is the last weekend of April, is that right? Or the second? 26, April 26. Okay. So if you want to be a part of that in uh, uh, Pigeon Forge, Gatlinburg, you can be a part of that. Okay. Next Sunday, Palm Sunday, is our Kid City Easter egg hunt. Weather permitting, it will be on the hill. If weather doesn't permit, we'll still have an Easter egg hunt, okay? So make sure you bring those kids, and uh, we'll do that right after service next week. And uh, Josh will tell you a little bit more in just a moment, but the youth will be selling lunch to go along with that as well to help uh, our kids who are going on uh, mission this summer, okay? And no Kid City due to the Easter egg hunt and Easter uh, next Sunday and on Easter Sunday, they will have Kid City uh, today. All right? And uh, for the rest, uh, life choices, donations, you can um, continue to bring those until next week. And then they'll be uh, dropped off in memory and in honor of the Carter family. They lost uh, little Abigail a couple weeks ago. Uh, and then a couple other things happening. But for that, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Josh here in just a moment and let him give you an update on the youth. But I will tell you this real quick. It is uh, St. Patrick's Day. So when we get up in just a few moments to greet one another, if they don't have green on, uh, don't pinch them. Okay. That's not very, it's not a kind way to welcome and encourage people to come back to church by pinching them. 
okay? Um, but I do want to read something real quick. This comes from Patrick himself. A, I don't know why we call it St. Patrick's Day because he was never given sainthood, okay? He's just Patrick. Um, and fun fact, Patrick's not Irish. Did you know that? He's not Irish, okay? He's from Scotland, okay? And at 16 years old, he was captured by Irish pirates and enslaved in Ireland. And about six years later, uh, he escaped, went back to his home, studied to be a priest, and then returned back to Ireland to tell the people who had enslaved him about Jesus. That's who Patrick was. It ain't about leprechauns and rainbows and pots of gold and lucky charms and all those things, okay? Patrick was a missionary who wanted to tell people about Jesus, the same one who had sustained him through a tough time in his life. And at one point he wrote this, Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left, Christ when I lie down, Christ when I sit down, Christ when I arise, Christ in the heart of every man who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me, Christ in every eye that sees me, and Christ in every ear that hears me. That should give you a little insight into Patrick's heart. All right, Josh, come on up. He's got a couple of things he's going to share with us, and then when he is done, we'll stand and greet one another, okay? Um, sorry. Ooh, that's hot. Uh, just a few quick announcements. Um, one about this Palm Sunday lunch. Um, we, all the proceeds we get from that will be going to help pay for our youth missionaries this summer. Uh, you saw the cost of California is $800 a ticket approximately, and so we're just trying to bring that cost as low as possible for our students so that we can uh, send them out. And, um, you know, everyone most likely will eat tomorrow, uh, next Sunday, so if you would eat a cheeseburger, a hamburger, hot dogs, that's what we're going to be having. Uh, $10 for adults, uh, $5 for anyone below the age of 18, so an uh, easy, good way to, you know, support our youth. Um, so, I'm gonna, if you would... If you were here with us last year, we, uh, this, about this time last year, we were actually renovating the building, uh, the building next door. And I don't know if I have, if they're on the screen. It's kind of hard to see, but you can just see the before pictures and in the after pictures, uh, some of the work that we did. And we did this in about a month. Um, so you can see how we've changed you know, the kitchen space. We've now got a good space for them to hang out. And they've really um, enjoyed it. Um, you don't necessarily see it because it's in a separate building, but you know memories and things are occurring um, in that space. And could you go to the next slide, please? And so just another picture of what, what has happened since that time uh, in the past year. So you can see that um, the room, um, that room is actually where we do most of our, like if we're having a whole gathering, uh, that's the space and it's getting a little cramped at times. Uh, it works for quick announcements, but when we have a longer lesson, 20 minutes, you know, we need a little bit bigger space. And that really just leads into um, something. We're gonna continue doing some work in the youth building, and I've got some good news about that as well. So would you go to the next slide for us? So here's just giving you a plan of what's gonna hopefully be happening. Uh, we plan on painting these walls, so I don't know when the last time they were painted was, um, but it's probably been a while. Uh, so paint, just some new paint and new flooring, that's the goal. Uh, next slide, you can see this is a hallway leading to some of the classrooms. Again, just wanting to put some fresh paint on the wall, uh, some new laminate floors down. Uh, that hallway is kind of dark, so hoping to put uh, some light in there as well, update the lighting. But the big one is the chapel. And I feel like just saying that uh, maybe evokes different emotions, like it's sacred, like we can't, it's gotta be preserved and stay like that. Um, but the heart behind it is not renovation, but restoration restoring it to a place where we can use it more frequently. And that really just means the same thing we've been saying. It needs new paint. It hasn't been painted in a while. And it means the floor. The carpet is really, really bad. Um, and so the dream 
is to rip up the carpet and refinish the hardwood that's underneath. The, um, the labor to do that has already been donated, by the way. Uh, someone's agreed to do the hardwood you know, for free. All we have to do is pay for the material to uh, sand it. And I know that some people, uh, I've, you know, as I've talked through it with a few, are worried about like, what are their holes and different things like that. But to me, that room is 100 years old. You know, there's memories there. And I'm looking forward to seeing the marks in the floor, the life that's been in there in the past. And so it is not to redo this whole room. It's really just to restore it uh, to something beautiful that we can use for the next generation. Because um, we do, we need space, you know, and there's mornings that um, we're, we're running around, but then sometimes we need the chairs in there, and so it's, we're taking down, putting back, and the pews, if you would go to the next slide, the pews are stored back there, and they're heavy, and it's annoying and hard on backs to be moving those in and out, and so be, we're not using this space because we're having to, we're just going back and forth between the spaces. And so we're wanting to just make this into a place, make it into a space that is really functional for, again, next generation ministry. Uh, this includes kids. You know, they have, it, we don't have a gym. And we're not wanting to change that to a gym, but we need a bigger open space, something that's a little bit easier uh, to use. And then there's, I think, one more. Um, we're wanting to buy vanities um, for the bathrooms. I see Miss Kim nodding her head, shaking yes, because they're kind of dated as well. I'm sure they're original to the building. Now, God is so cool um, because this has already been, we had a donation anonymous um, a couple of months ago, and it's been hard keeping it a secret to the youth and to others of about, eight, I think, 18,000. So I'm not asking you to donate to this. I'm just letting you know the Lord is at work and we're doing this work again to reach next generation. It's not renovation, it is restoration. Um, and so over the next couple of weeks you're going to see us maybe painting and things might, there may be a Sunday that the building, the chapel parts closed and things like that but we're really just talking paint, floor, and a few different lighting elements throughout that building um, and that will really basically remodel and, you know, bring that up to, um, I don't want to say standards or anything, but just it'll, it'll be a beautiful place, a beautiful space, again, for next gen. So that's all. Thank you, Josh. And uh, again, uh, I think on that front, too, um, Josh, do you have any rough numbers of what has been raised so far for our kids to go on mission uh, this summer? Thirty-one twenty. So that's awesome, awesome, awesome. The Lord is at work in our uh, student ministry, and we are so grateful for it. All right. That has already run a little bit long, but I do want to give you time uh, just to welcome one another. So stand to your feet. Don't pinch your neighbor, but shake their hand or give them a hug, okay? Welcome to Rutledge Falls Baptist Church. If you can make your way back to your seats, we'll begin our worship with a call to worship, which comes from not, uh, Psalm 95, 3 through 7, and it says this, for the Lord is a great God, a great king above all kings. The depths of the earth are in his hand and the mountain peaks are his. 
The sea is his, he made it. His hands formed the dry land. Come, let's worship and bow down. Let's kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the sheep under his care. So this morning, as we begin singing Mighty God, Father, Friend, this song reminds us once again of this mighty king, this mighty God who indeed loves us and cares for us. So let us sing together. Like water in your hand My heart beats at the guidance of your breath The heaven sings and the whole earth bows its head It's a wonder that I'm loved Mighty God, defender, father, friend Mighty God, sustainer to the end. Mighty God, in you alone I find my rest. Mighty God, Father, friend. The earth endures only as you have ordained the mountains split beneath the current of your grace the heaven sings and the whole earth shouts your name it's a wonder that i'm loved mighty god defender father friend Mighty God, sing to the end. Mighty God, in you alone I find my rest. Mighty God, Father, friend. Mighty God. Mighty God, defender, father, friend. Mighty God, sustainer to the end. Mighty God, in you alone I find my rest. Mighty God. is his name 
Now we move into our time of responsive scripture reading. This comes from Psalm chapter 16, verses 5 through 8. So if you'll join me in reading the underlying portion. It says, Lord, you are my portion and my cup of blessing. You hold my future. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. So let's read this together. I will bless the Lord who counsels me, even at night when my thoughts trouble me. I always let the Lord guide me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. So we have this fount of blessing, this, this one who counsels us in times of need and sorrow, in times of darkness. Our Lord is with us. We have this fount of many blessings. So let us sing now, come thou fount. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above praise the mount I'm fixed upon it the mount of thy redeeming love here I raise my Ebenezer hither by thy I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus saw me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood Oh to grace how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be let thy grace Lord like a feather by my wandering From to wonder, Lord, I feel it. From to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. From sinning, I shall see thy lovely face, clothed then in blood washed linen. How I'll sing thy sovereign grace, how his kindness yet pursues me, mortal tongue can never tell. Clothed in Till death shall lose me, I cannot proclaim it well.
thank you so much for the truths that we have sung this morning, that we have a fount of many blessings given to us in Christ Jesus. Lord, knowing this truth, knowing this fount of many blessings, Lord, may it lead us to have a greater love for you. And Lord, may we ask and plead with you to abide with us in this life. Lord, encourage us through our tithing and through hearing your word preached. Lord, just continue to work by your spirit in this service. Lord, we love you. Amen. Seated, I'll ask, uh, well, no, I'll turn your attention to the screen, and we should have a short video uh, Joseph from and our North Gibbons, American missionaries. Hey, we're Joseph and Kristen Gibbons, and we grew up in Southern Baptist churches. It's where God called us to ministry, and we are now planting Favor City Church in Henderson, Nevada, which is in the greater Las Vegas Valley. And thank you for supporting us in our new church in the city as we're here to make Jesus known. And thank you for continuing to lead your church in giving to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. We could not do this without you. Hi, my name is Jefferson Hernandez. And I'm Carol Hernandez. We are an ordinary family in the hands of the extraordinary living God who has called us to make Jesus known. 
We want to thank you for your prayers and your gifts because he has helped us to reach the Hispanic community. Hi, we're the Glimp family from Jacksonville, Florida. We're church planting missionaries here doing all we can to make Jesus known. I just want to say thank you for giving so generously to the Annie Armstrong offering and your prayers that enable us to do the work that we're doing here, the gospel work that's so needed. We just wanted to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that is just three of the hundreds of families that are uh, working as church planters and missionaries all across North America. Um, and that we are giving to through our Annie Armstrong offering. So I'll ask our ushers to go ahead and make their way forward. If you do want to give to Annie Armstrong, there should be some uh, envelopes in the pew in front of you. You can drop that in that envelope, make it out to the church, and then we will put it all together uh, at the end of our um, month as we finish that out. Uh, and if you have just a regular gift to give, you can do so either online or right now in person. All right, Brother Michael Ducker is our Deacon of the Week, and uh, he's dressed more like a preacher today than I am, so come on up, Michael. You can just keep on talking if you want to. No? Okay. All right. If you'll pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to come before you to praise and thank you for the opportunity to gather in your house this morning, Lord. I pray you'll just uh, bless each and every person here. May we just leave this morning, Lord. Uh, knowing you in a better relationship and a deeper relationship than we came. Pray you'll be with the offering. May you just use it to the betterment of your kingdom. I just ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. to do some training on which aisle to go down for these guys. And as they are passing by, our kids can make their way out over here to Miss Donna and Mr. Bob for Kid City Church. And if you have your copy of God's Word this morning, I invite you to turn to Exodus 32. Exodus 32. This uh, sermon has been simmering on the pot for three weeks, so it's either just right or it's overcooked. Um, and so we'll see at the end of the day, okay? I've been trying to preach it for three weeks, but uh, other things have happened, and that's okay. Uh, and so here we go, Exodus chapter 32. Just a reminder of where we are headed in the next couple of weeks. Um, we will kind of put a close to the book of Exodus next Sunday, Palm Sunday. Um, as we get to, we'll, we'll take a look at chapters 33 and 34, and then... I'll do just a brief summary of the end of the book. Um, as we kind of summarized a lot of the law, we summarized a lot of the instructions of the building of the tabernacle and all of those things. Uh, in the last several chapters, we get the execution of those plans to build the tabernacle. And so we'll look at that in the big picture uh, since next week and close out our time in the book of Exodus. And then you probably... Um, know what I'm preaching about on Easter. Uh, there was this man named Jesus who is dead but now is alive. And so we'll talk about that today and next Sunday, but then we'll talk about it on Easter as well. Uh, and so Romans chapter 6, uh, being raised with Christ, is where we will be on Easter Sunday. And then right after that, we are going to kick off the book of Revelation. Uh, so first Sunday of April, uh, we will be in the book of Revelation, and uh, we invite you to come and be a part of that and invite others to be a part of it as well. We just sang a song, and the line says this, Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness 
like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. The author of this great hymn that has been passed down through generations uses a word there, let thy goodness like a fetter, not necessarily a common word in our day and age, Um, but he says, let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. And in that line, he gives us an idea of what a fetter is. It's a chain. It would bind uh, someone, most like sometimes a prisoner, to the place where they are supposed to stay. And so he is saying, Lord, bind my wandering heart to you. Why? Because he says, I'm prone to wonder. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. And as we come to Exodus chapter 32 this morning, we find the words of come thou found to be very appropriate. We have walked with the Israelites in their journey so far. We have seen them receive direct revelation from God in the Ten Commandments. We have seen them receive law through the intercessor Moses. We have seen God's care for them. We have seen God's provision for them. We have seen them make promises to the Lord that they will do everything that God has said. They have said it multiple times. Lord, we will do everything that you have commanded. And yet we will find them in Exodus 32, wandering away almost as quickly as they made the promise to do everything that God has commanded. And so we see Their hearts, our hearts, are prone to wander. We are prone to sin, and we must be bound to the Lord and his grace that we are indebted to. So would you stand with me in the honor of the reading of God's word this morning? We're going to read the entire chapter. It's a little bit lengthy, so if you need to sit down or stay seated, I understand. I have been there on days where I could hardly stand. Exodus chapter 32, beginning in verse 1. When the people saw that Moses delayed in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come, make gods for us who will go before us, because this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. So Aaron replied to them, Take off the gold rings that are on the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the gold rings that were on their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took the gold from them, fashioned it with an engraving tool, and made it into an image of a calf. And then they said, Israel, these are your gods who brought you up from the land of Egypt." And when Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of it and made an announcement. There will be a festival to the Lord tomorrow. And early the next morning they arose, offered burnt offerings, and presented fellowship offerings. The people sat down to eat and drink, and they got up to party. The Lord spoke to Moses, go down at once, for your people you brought up from the land of Egypt have acted corruptly. They have quickly turned from the way I had commanded them. They have made for themselves an image of a calf. They have bowed down to it, sacrificed to it, and said, Israel, these are your gods who brought you up from the land of Egypt. And the Lord also said to Moses, I have seen this people, and they are indeed a stiff-necked people. Now leave me alone so that my anger can burn against them and I can destroy them. Then I will make you into a great people nation. But Moses sought the favor of the Lord his God. Lord, why does your anger burn against your people you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and a strong hand? Why should the Egyptians know? Uh, Why should the Egyptians say he brought them out with an evil intent to kill them in the mountains and eliminate them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce anger and relent concerning this disaster planned for your people. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. You swore to them by yourself and declared, I will make your offspring as numerous as the stars of the sky and will give your offspring all this land that I have promised and they will inherit it forever. So the Lord relented concerning the disaster he had said he would bring on his people. Then Moses turned and went down 
the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hands. They were inscribed on both sides, inscribed front and back. And the tablets were the work of God, and the writing was God's writing engraved on the tablets. When Joshua heard the sound of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, There is a sound of war in the camp. But Moses replied, It's not the sound of a victory cry, not the sound of a cry of defeat. I hear the sound of singing. And as he approached the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, Moses became enraged and threw the tablets out of his hands, smashing them at the base of the mountain. He took the calf they had made, burned it up, and ground it to powder, and he scattered the powder over the surface of the water and forced the Israelites to drink the water. And then Moses asked Aaron, what did these people do to you that you have led them into such a grave sin? Don't be enraged, my Lord, Aaron replied. You yourself know that the people are intent on evil. They said to me, make gods for us who will go before us because this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. And so I said to them, whoever has gold, take it off. And they gave it to me. And when I threw it into the fire, out came this calf. Moses saw that the people were out of control, and for Aaron had let them get out of control, making them a laughing stock to their enemies. And Moses stood at the camp's entrance and said, whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And all the Levites gathered around him. And he told them, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, every man fasten his sword to his side, go back and forth through the camp from entrance to entrance, and each of you kill his brother, his friend, and his neighbor. And the Levites did as Moses commanded, and about 3,000 men fell dead that day among the people. Afterward, Moses said, today you have been dedicated to the Lord since each man went against his son and his brother. Therefore, you have brought a blessing on yourselves today. The following day, Moses said to the people, you have committed a grave sin. Now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I will be able to atone for your sin. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, oh, these people have committed a grave sin. They have made a God of gold for themselves. Now, if you would only forgive their sin, but if not, please erase me from the book you have written. The Lord replied to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I will erase from my book. Now go, lead the people to the place I told you about. See, my angel will go before you, but on the day I settle accounts, I will hold them accountable for their sin. And the Lord inflicted a plague on the people for what they did with the calf Aaron had made. You may be seated. There is certainly a lot happening in this story. And before we get to the main point, let me do just a little bit of reminding you of where we are at in this narrative. Moses has been on the mountain. Uh, Chapter 24 ends by telling us that he spent 40 days and 40 nights on Mount Sinai receiving the law and the word from God. So in chapters 20 through 23, they have, uh, through 24, they have received some law about how to treat one another, how to do some of these things. They've received the Ten Commandments. They heard those directly from God, all the people did. And then through Moses, they heard many other laws. And then Moses went up on the mountain. A cloud uh, consumed uh, the mountain to where it was just a meeting between Moses and and the Lord. And when this narrative happens, we don't know how long he's been up there, but we do come to understand that they think he's been up there too long. And what Moses is receiving while he's on the mountain is essentially chapters 25 through 31, these instructions of uh, how the priests are to consecrate themselves for worship, how they are to build the tabernacle so that they can come into the presence of the Lord, and all of these things. He's receiving this to go and take it back to the people, tell them how they can meet with God. But we find them in chapter 32, believing and thinking that Moses has been gone too long. And they said, we don't know what's happened to him. Maybe he's died up there. Maybe he's never coming back. And so we've got to figure out something to do for ourselves. 
And so here's what we see. The main idea I want you to go home with today is that our sin deserves God's wrath, but can be met with unmerited mercy. Our sin deserves God's wrath, but it can be met with unmerited mercy. And how do we take hold of that mercy? That's where I hope to get us towards the end of this message. The first thing we see about sin in this passage is that sin is very deceptive. Sin is very deceptive. Look what the people of Israel begin to do. They're growing impatient with Moses. And so while they are waiting on him, unsure as to whether or not he's even going to come back, they go back to what they know. We've said this over and over again, but these are a people who don't know how to be God's people. They've never been God's people before. All the life they have known is captivity in Egypt. They've known Egypt's gods, Egypt's ways of worship. And so when they feel this urge in their hearts and in their lives to worship, they're going to worship like they have seen. They go back to what they know. And because Egypt had gods formed in images and even gods formed in the image of a calf like they make, they say to Aaron, hey, let's make ourselves something to worship. They go back to what they know because all they had known was idol worship. And listen, the same is true for us. We are prone to wander, and sin so deceives us that we will run back to the very things that we recognized at one point in our life was killing us, was separating us from God. And if we're not careful, we'll find ourselves, like an addict, just returning back to the same thing over and over again. That's why the Scriptures say, that we need to be transformed by the renewing of our mind on a daily basis because we are prone to wander, prone to run back to what we know. So what we see is that they have learned the ways of the world and when push comes to shove, they go back to the ways of the world. And the same must be True, uh, can be true for us. We cannot expect to buddy up with the world and not be affected by it. Sin has so deceived them that I'm not even sure they believe they're doing anything wrong. And we can look at it and we can say, well, listen, it kind of looks like their hearts are in the right place. They're calling this God Yahweh. They know his name. Aaron says, hey, let's offer these up to the Lord. I told you a while ago, when you see capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D in your Bible, that is a substitution for the divine name that was given in Exodus chapter 3 to Moses before he ever even started out on this journey. I am Yahweh. So Aaron says, hey, let's let's make sacrifices to Yahweh. Maybe their heart's in the right place. Maybe they're worshiping the right God. They even are praising this God for the right act. They say, hey, let's give him praise because he brought us out of the land of Egypt. They use the right name. They're praising it for the right act, but they've made a compromise. They've heard the Ten Commandments directly from Yahweh's mouth. And they have strictly violated them by making a God out of this gold. Friends, sometimes we're so deceived by our sin that we do the same. We make excuses. We say, well, my heart was in the right place, even though what we did was clearly sinful. We'll say, the Lord knows my heart. We treat sin in this world very subjectively. Very subjectively because we live in a world where everything is relative. 
Everything is relative in the world we live in. And so we base our view of sin on a variety of things. What's the view of culture? Does this make me feel good? Does it make me happy? Is it harming anyone else? And under these rules, what is sin and what is not can be constantly shifting and constantly changing. And that's why sin is so deceptive. It's so subjective in this world that we don't even know where the line is, and we have bought it hook, line, and sinker. But there is an objective standard found in God's Word to where they cannot go back and say, but our hearts were in the right place, Lord. We named it Yahweh. We praised it for bringing us out of Egypt. And the Lord would say, have I not commanded you not to make anything in the image of God and worship it? There is an objective. They had an objective. We have an objective. God's word is the plumb line. That's what we compare ourselves to. That's where we go for what is sin and what is not. Not feelings, not culture, not tradition. In a world that is shifting fast, as we can say, fast, we must go back to the Word of God for what is right and what is wrong. Amen. Sin has not and will not ever be subjective. What God says is good is good. What God says is sin is sin throughout all of history. For the Israelites in the wilderness and for Tennesseans in Coffee County in 2024. See, sin is deceptive. And the Lord says all the way back in the book of Genesis that sin, in the story of Cain and Abel, said that sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you. It might be easy for us to say, what's the big deal? It's just a little calf. Why is God so angry about that? What's the big deal? Can I just remind you this morning that there's no finite image or sculpture that can define an infinite God Inevitably, if we make some form of a God out of something that we can see, touch, and feel, we are limiting a limitless God. We become what we behold. We are shaped by what our eyes are fixed on, is another way to say that. And so if we are fixed upon this static calf or image or whatever it is, that becomes our God to us. And we cannot put God in that form or fashion. He is infinite. He is limitless. He is who he is. He has been who he always will be. And any of our attempts to define him or to make him into something that we can manage and makes us feel better ultimately limit his power, his majesty, and his character. But I think it would be very easy for us to say that idolatry looks a little bit different in our world. Most of us are not fashioning golden calves or any other form of an idol to worship. We understand that. We're not making these things for us. Idolatry at its core is simply putting something or someone in place of God. So what are some of our modern idols? Well, the list could go on and on, but a few came to my mind as I was preparing. Comfort, entertainment, money, sex, politics, identity, Oh, mercy, are we consumed with our identity in this world we live in? Tim Keller said this, An idol is anything more important to you than God. Anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God. Anything you seek 
to give you what only God can give. Anything that is so central and essential to your life that should you lose it, your life would feel hardly worth living. What is it that we are in pursuit of more than anything else? Those can be idols in our lives. It's not just images of foreign gods. It's not the world that you and I live in. Sometimes it's good things that take the place of the greatest thing, that become the idols of our hearts. And sin can deceive us in that way to think, my heart's in the right place. I'm doing the right things. I'm not sinning. They're so deceived. They're so believing that they're doing nothing wrong that what does the word tell us that they get up and do? It says they work early the next morning to do what? To party. They're like, man, we have nailed this. We got this worshiping thing down. Let's throw a party. Even so much that later on Joshua says, man, it sounds like the sound of war in the camp. And Moses says, no, that's not a song of victory. It's, it's not a song of defeat. He says, that's the sound of singing, the sound of worship, the sound of praise. They're throwing a party because they think they have done so well in creating something for themselves to worship. They're deceived by sin. Second thing we see is that our sin seeks to shift blame. We'll fast forward a little bit. We'll come back to the middle portion of this text in just a few moments. And let's take a look at a, a conversation that happens between Moses and Aaron there in verse 21. You rightly laughed at the response of Aaron to Moses because it is just a joke. Moses says, Aaron, what have you done? And Aaron, not wanting to take any personal responsibility, says, oh, come on, Moses, you know these people. They're evil. And so they wanted something to worship, and so just, I just accommodated them, and I said, hey, give me your gold, and look, I threw it in the fire, and out came this calf. As if he had nothing at all to do with it. And in our sin, that is often what we seek to do, to shirk personal responsibility and to throw it upon someone else. He shifts the blame to all of the other people. It's not Aaron's fault. It's that evil person's fault. But Aaron's not the first one to shift blame when he has been found in his sin. What did Adam do when the Lord confronted him in the garden? He says, this woman you gave me. No personal responsibility, shifting the blame because that's what the deception of sin does to us. And friends, you and I are just as good at making excuses or just as bad, depending on how you want to look at it, right? Pretty terrible excuse for Aaron to say, I just threw it in there and this calf came out. I don't know how that happened, right? We're just as good at making excuses. Everybody else was doing it. It felt right at the time. It makes me happy. They made me do it. Well, it's legal now. What's so wrong? I didn't mean to do it. And we make all of these excuses. But here's what we read in Proverbs chapter 28. The one who conceals his sin will not prosper. But whoever confesses and renounces them will find mercy. The choice is yours, says Tony Merida. Conceal or confess. Friends, we often want to conceal, cover it up so that others don't know that we have done and we become so deceived to think that we may not have even done anything wrong in the first place. But instead of concealing our sin, we are called to confess our sin. Instead of running from our sin, we are called to repent of our sin, to turn from it and turn to Jesus. In 1 John chapter 1, John writes this, If we say we have no sin... We're deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. 
But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. We must take responsibility for for our sin, confess it, and it's in confession that we find the forgiveness that our hearts and our souls truly need. The final thing we see about sin in this passage is that sin requires a substitute. Moses' role in this whole scene is of the utmost importance. So much of the story of Moses is just a shadow, it's a type, it's a picture of Christ, of the one who is to come. We see his rescue work, his redeeming work, just as Jesus came to rescue and redeem. We see him in this role, uh, in this story, taking on the role of an intercessor. And we even see him willing to take on the role of a substitute. I don't know if you noticed that language, but I'm going to point it out to you again in just a moment. But Moses takes on this role of intercessor. In the middle of the chapter, he has this conversation with the Lord there on the mountain after God has come to him and says, Moses, you've got to go down at once. These people have turned from me. And we know uh, in our own human feelings how God is feeling at that moment because he, like the angry father who says to the wife, Your son, your daughter, right? We know those moments when our kids are no longer our kids. They're our spouse's kids, right? Audrey right now, she doesn't do anything bad. She's just wild. She's almost eight months old, and she's wild. She's into everything. And so I often have to look at Megan and say, your daughter, she ain't mine when she does all that. So God says, your people you brought up out of Egypt have acted corruptly. He's not claiming them as his own at this moment. It says his anger is burning against them. And Moses steps in as an intercessor in verse 11. And it's almost as if Moses has not captured the full weight of how bad it is. Because he says, Lord, why does your anger burn? And he calls back on the the glory of God, which are are wonderful things for Moses to to bring up. It's not that God has forgotten him. God doesn't forget. It's not that God is not going to keep his promises. God keeps his promises. We see that God indeed has every right to be angry. We know what it's like to feel anger. Sometimes we feel sinful anger, but sometimes we feel righteous anger. There are things that happen in this world that should make us righteously angry. When our world continually calls evil good, it should make us angry. It should make us angry that we slaughter the unborn by the millions. If you don't get angry about that, there's something wrong with your heart. God has every right to be angry at sin because he is holy, holy, holy. It's not God being mean. It's not God having a temper. God has righteous anger at his sin. Wrath is what they deserved. Wrath is what we deserve. But enter the intercessor, Moses, on Israel's behalf, foreshadowing the great intercessor, Jesus, who intercedes on our behalf. He says, If you wipe them out, the Egyptians are just going to say, he brought them out of here just to kill them. That's not what you promised. In verse 14, it says, the Lord relented concerning the disaster he had said he would bring on his people. Perhaps you have a translation that says the Lord repented. Let me just make a note real quick. God has never had to repent of any sin because God has never sinned. I don't think repented is the best translation in that moment. But even so, there are things all throughout the scriptures which 
are simply what we call, and I think this is what's happening here, anthropomorphisms. Us seeking to put human words to someone who is not human. In fact, Moses has already done it. He says, you brought them out with a strong hand. Does Yahweh have a hand? No. He's spirit. He doesn't have a hand. But we see from our perspective, he led them out by his guiding hand. He relented from bringing. From the perspective of Moses, from our perspective, he relented of bringing the disaster. He doesn't change. It's not who he is, but we put the language to come to understand what the Lord has done. And so don't think that the Lord had to repent of any sin in this instance because that is not the case at all. But Moses intercedes on behalf of his people. We see that Jesus does the same for us. Because of Moses' intercession and the repentance of the majority of Israel, which we see later, I think is um, implied in the text when Moses says, you know, bring, uh, if you're with me, if you're with the Lord, come to me. The Levites gather around, they go, and, they, and, and it's a, a brutal scene. He says, you're going to have to take out some of these. And I think what we can infer, and I, and, and I think what we can see from the text is that these were sinful men who were not apologizing and repenting of the sin of what they have done in worshiping an idol. And the Lord was serious about getting the sin out of the camp. Because of Moses' intercession on their behalf, they are met with mercy instead of the wrath of God. And at the very beginning, I said our sin deserves wrath, but it can be met by unmerited mercy. When we say unmerited, it's not because we earn the mercy in any way, but he gives it to us if we call upon him. They turn to him. They turn away from worshiping our foreign gods. And because of the intercession of Jesus, we too can be met by God's mercy. It says, therefore, in Hebrews chapter 7, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him since he always lives to intercede for them. In those few verses there, before Moses comes down off the mountain, he's interceding for the people of Israel on their behalf, and he's saying almost, it can't be that bad. But then he comes down the mountain, and he realizes how bad it is, right? Because what happens? When he comes down, he throws down the two tablets of the law, and they're broken. And there's a great symbolism in the breaking of those two tablets because it is showing that this covenant that has been made between God and his people have been broken. Spoiler alert, just a couple of chapters later, a new set of stone tablets will be given and the covenant will be renewed because God is a merciful and a gracious God. But Moses comes down and he sees how bad the situation is. But Moses again goes back to intercede. He goes back to the Lord. And if you're not convinced yet that Moses is just a foreshadowing of Jesus, see what he says in verse 32. He says to the Lord, Now, if only, if you would only forgive their sin, but if not, please erase me from the book you have written. He says, Forgive their sin. I'll, I'll, I'll take care of it. I'll do it if I can. I will atone for their sin if they can, and if you will not forgive, Take me, Lord. The reality is, though Moses was willing, he was not able. Because Moses was a sinful man just like the rest of Israel. He was stained by sin, and God requires a perfect sacrifice. The good news for us today is that Jesus was both willing and able to be our perfect sacrificial sacrifice substitute for our sin only jesus was willing and able to be that sacrifice for our sins second corinthians 5 21 says that he made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of god 
John chapter 10, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd and I lay down my life for the sheep. Moses was willing, but he was not able. Jesus was willing and able to lay down his life and take it back up again for our sin. So in this world stained by sin, in my idolatry, in your idolatry, friends, we need a substitute. We need someone to take our place, and that someone is Jesus. And so what we see and how our sin, though we deserve God's wrath, can be met with unmerited mercy is by confessing with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believing in our heart that God has raised him from the dead. And then you will find this to be true, that Jesus has saved us from the penalty of sin. He is saving us from the power of sin. And one day he will save us from the presence of sin. Do you know the New Testament talks about our salvation in all of those tenses? That we have been saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved. The gospel is constantly at work in our hearts and in our lives. It's not just something that we trust in one time and then we move on to greater things. The gospel is the hub of the wheel that keeps us spinning until Jesus comes back for us or we go to be with him. He has saved you from the penalty of sin. He has called you righteous, not based upon your own righteousness, but the righteousness of Jesus. He is saving you by his Holy Spirit from the power of sin as he transforms you day by day into the image of himself. And he will save you from the presence of sin when one day he returns and we are glorified and dwell with him forevermore. Jesus and only Jesus can save you, will save you, and will keep you saved for all of eternity. So friends, there's a little bit of bad news this morning. You and I are great sinners. The good news is Jesus is a better Savior. Like I am really, really good at sinning, but Jesus is even better at saving. Trevin Wax says this, sin is real, it's powerful, it's present, it's pervasive, but it's also defeated. Because the Spirit of God, sin can be forgiven, and it can also be fault. I'm a great sinner. You're a great sinner. Prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. But Jesus is a greater Savior. Grace wins every time. If you'll trust in Christ alone. Let's pray together. Lord, we love you. We are indeed prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it day by day. So my prayer are the words of that song, bind my wandering heart to thee. We can be so deceived by the ways of the world, by sin in our lives, so deceived that we, like the Israelites, don't even realize that we are wallowing in it. We can seek to shift the blame to others around us. We can say the devil made me do it. But we are responsible for our sin. And our sin requires a substitute. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. But the problem with my blood and the blood of every person in this room, the blood of every bull and goat and ram and everything else is that that blood could not atone for the sins of the world. There was one and only one who could shed his perfect spotless blood for the sins of the world. His name was Jesus and he did it willingly and he did it perfectly. He shed his blood for the forgiveness of sins so that all who would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. It is through Jesus in which we receive this forgiveness. We are great sinners. There's not one in this room who could say that's not true. Yet you are a greater Savior.
So yes, Lord, we need to face the reality of our sin, that we deserve the wrath of God because of our sin. And it is in facing the reality of our sin that we see that we receive much more than just mediocre grace in Jesus. It is truly amazing grace that he would save a wretch like me. So I pray today if there's one who's coming here this morning, their eyes have been opened to their sin. That you would not leave them in their sin, but today you would convict their hearts to turn from their sin and turn towards Jesus and receive the unmerited mercy that I have received. I don't deserve it. I didn't earn it, but Jesus did it for me. I've simply trusted him. And oh, for grace to trust him more. Lord, we need you. Have your way. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we stand to sing this morning, we offer up our praise to the one who has paid our debt, to the one who has saved us, is saving us, and will save us. And if you don't know that one, I'd be happy to tell you about him. I'll be down front. I'd love to speak with you if you need help discerning what the Lord is doing in your heart and in your life. If you want to pray, this altar is open, but you lift up your praise to the only one worthy of it all. Is a love for us how vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make her wretch his treasure how great the pain of searing loss the father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory upon his shoulders ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers here was my sin that held him there until Jesus. 
Thank you. We thank you for your son, for his perfect life, his sacrificial death, and his victorious resurrection. And that in him and through him we have life eternal. So, Lord, I pray by your Holy Spirit you continue to move and work in the hearts and lives of men and women in this room this morning. Whether they have a need that only you can meet, whether they have a need for salvation, Lord, a need for comfort, a need for peace, Lord, you are all of those things and more. So, Lord, bind us to you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's end here with uh, Romans chapter 16, 25 through 27. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to the gospel and the proclamation about Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept silent for long ages, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic scriptures, according to the command of the eternal God to advance the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles, to the only wise God through Jesus Christ, to him be glory forever. Amen. Let me say one more thing. We don't like to talk about sin a whole lot in the world we live in anymore. But the muddier we get on sin, the less amazing God's grace looks. You know why a lot of people don't want what we have, what you claim to have? It's because they don't really see that there's anything wrong with what's going on. Because we have become so muddy on sin that what do we need grace for? Let's see our sin clearly so that we can see our Savior all the more clearly. Again, maybe this is the line you leave with. I am a great sinner, but Jesus is a better Savior. Jesus is a better Savior. And he loves you. And if you don't know him, you can know him today. And maybe you didn't come forward right a few minutes ago. But maybe you know you need to talk to somebody. I'll be right here. You come and find me. The rest of you, we love you. You are dismissed. We hope to see you back tonight.